Hello and welcome. My name is Ana Teresa Portillo. I am a member of the Canadian Network of Community Land Trust, acting chair of the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, a community benefits organizer, and a member of Mutual Aid Parkdale. The Canadian Network of Community Land Trust is a knowledge sharing forum fostering the success and growth of the community land trust model throughout Canada, building a healthy ecosystem of community owned affordable housing and other real estate assets in urban areas. Community land trusts are community or sector led nonprofit organizations which acquire and hold land in the interest of their local communities. CLTs operate on a variety of scales, choosing to represent either neighborhoods, cities, or regions. CLTs are long-term stewards of affordability, which work to ensure perpetually affordable housing and to secure space for high social benefit nonprofit enterprises. Currently, there are between 20 to 30 active CLTs across Canada. This webinar is a part of a series of webinars organized by the Canadian Network of Community Land Trust. I am thankful for this opportunity to bring together mutual aid organizers from Parkdale, Toronto, Milton Park, Montreal, Langley, British Columbia, to share their learnings and discuss mutual aid implications for the community land trust model. This webinar will be recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please indicate that in the chat box. Also, we will be having breakout groups in the latter half of this webinar, and those breakout groups will not be recorded. Mutual aid often refers to radically transforming. Uh, you can stay on the agenda. Mutual aid often refers to radically transforming the way we have relationships with one another. Mutual aid frameworks take seriously the nonprofit industrial complex that regulates and produces charitable interactions and relationships through the centralization of capital, power, and meaning making. Instead, mutual aid loudly declares solidarity, not charity, and seeks a radical redistribution and decentralization of resources, power, and knowledge production. We are blessed to be joined by mutual aid organizers who are currently responding to COVID-19 pandemic and the persistent crises of colonialism and capitalism. The language of mutual aid emerged in the United States with the Black Panthers and Young Lords during the Civil Rights Movement. However, such practices have long histories in Black and Indigenous anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, abolitionist, and liberation movements. Furthermore, mutual aid is grounded in a deep appreciation that life and meaning emerge from a dense set of cooperative and caring relationships. I will be asking speakers to introduce themselves as they speak for the first time. Thank you to all of those who have helped put this webinar together. In particular, Ivy Mary, who will be moderating the chat box and Joshua Barnt on tech support. We will open the webinar with a land acknowledgement, followed by a contextualization of the historical urgency of now. We will then delve deeper into what is mutual aid from a general overview to the insights and learnings of our guest speakers. In the latter half of the webinar, there will be an overview of the community land trust and cooperative model. This will be followed by a brief presentation animating emerging debates and lines of inquiry. Finally, we will break out into two groups to hold collective discussions around if and how community land trusts are redistributing power and ask what kind of relationship building practices are reflected in community land trust funding, community ownership and community control models. So we're gonna move on to the land acknowledgements. Thank you, Joshua, if we can, um, thank you. One more, beautiful. Thank you for joining our discussion today. We are all joining from stolen, unceded, and occupied indigenous lands. I am joining from Toronto and would like to acknowledge the sacred lands on which I stand. It has been the site of human activity for thousands of years. 
Today, the meeting place of Toronto, from the Mohawk word Takaranto, remains the home of many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. This land is the territory of the Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Anishinaabe peoples. Today, is in the dish, Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon territory is a treaty between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee that binds them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, settlers and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Other historical treaties that still apply to this territory are the Two Row Wampon Treaty and the Toronto Purchase Treaty Number 13. Treaties are ongoing living documents that require our action and accountability. We are responsible for upholding these treaties as well as implementing the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land and commit to questioning and searching for the right wor thoughts, words, actions, and hearts. Klee Benali of the Navajo Nation who founded Indigenous Mutual Aid Network and partners with Navajo Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund recently argued in a talk about mutual aid on May 14th, and I quote, we can be a lot more deep and imaginative while doing mutual aid than just making demands of the state right now. Mutual aid isn't just about radical distribution of resources. It's about radical redistribution of power. And for indigenous peoples, that means power to restore all our life ways, heal our communities and the land. That's where we get our power from, so our mutual aid extends to the land and non-human beings. I take issue with the proposal for left power struggles and revolution because I'm not interested in overthrowing one system to impose another. I'm interested in liberation of the land because that is where our governance flows from as indigenous anarchists. No law can be above nature. Settler and resource colonialism and capitalism have been and continue to be the crises that have dispossessed indigenous peoples throughout the world of our very means of survival. So if we have true solidarity and not charity on stolen lands, we must establish reciprocal terms that have deep understanding of those legacies." End quote. I am thankful to Benali for sharing his teaching about what solidarity looks like in practice on stolen lands. In this light, our next speaker weaves together a collective narrative to understand and represent the historical urgency of now. I would like to invite Desiree Wallace to introduce herself and speak to the current historical moment as the context for our discussion on mutual aid and implications of the community land trust model. Desiree, if you can unmute yourself, please make sure to introduce yourself as well. Thank you so much, Teresa. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you all today, even though it's through virtual means. <laughs> um, my name is Desiree Wallace. I'm calling in from uh, Ganyogehaga territory, um, the unceded, unsurrendered traditional territory here. And um, I just moved to these lands and I'm doing a lot of unlearning here. Um, but most of my mutual aid organizing thus far has been um, where I grew up. Um, as a settler on Kwantlen Creek, Simatsqui, and Semiami territory, um, more known as Langley, British Columbia. Um, and I've been working in alliance with uh, Coming Together Vancouver, which was initiated at the onset of the COVID-19 crisis um, to basically reshape uh, the narrative of the moment that we're in. And at the beginning of this crisis, especially in uh, so-called North America, we saw um, you know, these tendencies that come from fear, such as uh, hoarding and individualistic um, concerns. Um, and quickly we saw that narrative of the individual uh, shift and we saw people coming together on the hyper-local level within their neighborhoods and communities to support each other, especially where the government was not able to provide to the people. And we came together um, as community to fill in those gaps. And I think the moment 
that we're in right now is a huge window of opportunity. Um, pandemics historically have, have been the birthing of new narratives, of um, a different way of operating within the state, but also uh, within our communities. And, and right now I'm, I am working on a documentary film called Not Going Back. And this film uh, is, is a story of the people powered movement that is strengthening amidst COVID-19. Um, just as we saw in Occupy Wall Street, in I Don't Know More, in Black Lives Matter, the people are coming together with long-standing agency to rebuild more resilient, just, and equitable communities in the wake of this crisis. Only now, we are more readily prepared to win anti-austerity policies, governing systems, um, and reconciliation that leaves nobody behind. And I think it's really important to to recognize that uh, in this moment, you know, there's been this call to to go back to normal, to recover economic system. And right now, there are people gathering in so-called Canada and around the world to say no, to say defiantly, no, we we cannot go back to normal because our normal was already a state of converging crises. Um, and that includes health, economic, humanitarian, racism, and, and the climate crisis that is another global crisis we're all facing collectively. And so in this moment, we've really seen how the existing inequalities in our society have been exacerbated. Um, and I think now more than ever, um, citizens are realizing how close to the edge they are and in turn are very thirsty for social change. Um, so I think this is, this is a moment that we've been waiting for in a sense. You know, we've been sold this story of capitalism and colonialism um, for far too long. And finally, the, the people are coming together across Borders across backgrounds to to fight for a, a system that actually works for every single person in our society. And I appreciate the way in which Teresa uh, has opened up the floor with that in-depth land acknowledgement, um, because especially as a documentarian, I'm constantly thinking about whose voices are being centered in this new story and the voices that need to be centered are those who are most heavily impacted by the COVID-19 crisis and all of these other converging crises. And so as we move forward, we need to be mindful that this movement is one of deep, radical, long-standing um, long resistance and, and co-creation and and we think back to the civil rights movement we think back to the black panthers who were able to establish um you know a lunch program that was really at the heart of mutual aid and that's what we're trying to get back to we're trying to get back to a place in which we can foster stronger human connection and as you said teresa a stronger connection with the land and all of its beings. So moving forward, I think um, with that context, um, the last note I just wanna make is, uh, you know, for the past 10 years of my life, I'm 27, um, so still quite young. And I started doing climate justice work when uh, I was in high school. And um, the last 10 years of my life, I've traveled um, across so-called Canada, across Turtle Island and the world to engage with Indigenous communities primarily who are facing the destruction of large-scale industrial development on their lands um, and also being displaced by the climate crisis. And so there are a lot of converging crises we're seeing in this moment and, and as we move forward to address the pandemic, we must also um, address these other crises such as the climate crises and most recently um, the uprising we've seen uh, 
to fight back against police brutality and ensure community safety for all of society's individuals. Um, and so I think I'll just leave it on that note and uh, very excited to converse more so with all of you and uh, thankful to see this movement grow as a young person. It gives me hope that we can, um, that we can restore the integrity of our ecosystems, both socially and environmentally. So thank, thank, thank you, you so much. So much. <laughs> thank you so much, Desiree, for sharing that with us and your work and contextualizing the urgency of now. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your work and speaking to the moment of this deep reckoning and healing that opens up alternative radical futures and the impossibility of going back. Um, I'm going to do a really quick brief overview of what mutual aid means uh, and then we'll go in and ask speakers to introduce themselves and introduce their um, networks and the mutual aid work that they're doing. Um, when we speak about mutual aid, we are grounding ourselves in and celebrating Black women's, Indigenous women, two-spirited and non-gender conforming people's histories of survival and everyday resistant practices. Mutual aid practices and organizing disrupt and confront the institutionalization of health and safety, building community visions of health and safety from below. The mutual aid movement identifies the nonprofit and the NGO industrial complex as integral to systemic oppression, imperialism, and genocide. Moving away from notions of aid based on hierarchical charitable transactions, mutual aid animates and deepens our understanding and practice of solidarity. Miriam Kaba, in a recent talk about mutual aid says, that people transform in accountable relationships with one another. Solidarity is about learning to hold others accountable and allow yourself to be held accountable, equipping and empowering people to intervene when they see and feel something is wrong and to be able to transform and build deep meaning in relationships. Miriam Kaba suggests mutual aid is fundamentally about skill building or reskilling people within histories of the theft of traditional knowledge, resources, and ways of knowing. Working from a restorative justice framework, she argues for, I quote, a reclaiming of conflicts back from the state to manage them in our social relationships. When people defer to institutional power and decision making, we become de skilled, creating spaces of absence and our relationships are robbed of deep meaning and reciprocity. Through reskilling communities, reclaiming not only conflict, but illness as well, we create meaningful presence and build from below practices and systems of community safety and health. In particular, Miriam Kaba suggests the COVID-19 pandemic is a moment to identify and reclaim the stolen and forgotten skills we need to relate to and live together. Today, we have mutual aid organizers from Mutual Aid Parkdale, Parkdale Women's Leadership Group, Milton Park Citizens Committee, Solidarité Milton Park, and Coming Together Vancouver. I ask that each speaker introduce themselves as they speak for the first time and share about the networks, groups they are working in and the community they are located. First off, please welcome Teresa Padois, and Emily Brotman on behalf of Mutual Aid Parkdale. Hi, hi there. Uh, my name is Teresa Hernandez. Uh, I live in Parkdale area for 30 years and I was uh, one of the lucky key pod leaders in our community under the Parkdale Activity Recreation Center. I am part of uh, Mutual Aid because uh, they represent good values and have a good mission. Through this, I am helping the community by taking a major leadership role. I started to build a friendly network and allowed uh, them to share my contact information with people they know. And from there, I help out a lot of people gain access to resources for their needs such as groceries, face masks, and other health, including emotional. 
Um, my leadership feels like a natural gift with the help of other leaders like Teresa and Ivy and our PARC uh, pod leaders in our community. We were able to create a pod. We check in each other to make sure that everyone is on the same page and to share resources. Through all this uh, work we, uh, with other pod leaders, we have built solidarity in our community and allowed our community to become strong during these hard times. Uh, our vision is to give the best care experience we created together with the Mutual Aid Park Tail under PARC. We strive to give and achieve the best help and care to continue to improve our support to the Mutual Aid Park Tail. We provide a safe help to all the community including us leaders and our mission as a mutual aid park they will provide a compassionate care to all in need we provide care with kindness and sensitivity we help without judgment we treat everyone equitably and fair I, this is my passion i guess i want to inspire people to join us or to give them the motivation to help their community all over Toronto, Ontario, Canada, or everywhere. We, uh, we, we want to keep this momentum of helping each other because not everyone has the resource to go through this pandemic. And I want to continue to support my community and to be a symbol of hope. We are all in this together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, if I can ask Joshua to move towards the next slide. Um, I think we had a bio of Teresa up that we missed. My apologies, Teresa. Um, I'm Emily, would you like to also add something? Yeah, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Emily. I use her pronouns. Um, I'm an elementary school teacher and I'm also a pod leader with Mutual Aid Parkdale. And um, I am a white and Asian settler here. Um, and so I'm a guest on this land. Um, I guess I just add, uh, Teresa covered most of it, but Mutual Aid Parkdale, we sometimes refer to ourselves as MAP for short. Uh, we're a group of neighbors and we're organized on the core principle of practicing solidarity in times of crisis. So uh, we formed, um, out of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that started in the spring. And since then, we've been reaching out safely to hundreds of neighbors, um, providing uh, different kinds of support, material support, social support, providing um, and delivering food and medicine, checking in on each other, um, and providing emotional support. And um, as Teresa mentioned, we are in Parkdale. Parkdale is a neighborhood in the city of Toronto in the downtown core. Um, it's home to about 36,000 people. A third of our neighbors are recent immigrants. A third of our neighbors are living in poverty and almost 90% of the people living in Parkdale are renters. Um, Parkdale is Sadly, um, a site of very rapid gentrification, um, but it's also a very organized and strong community with a really strong presence from a number of different ethno-cultural communities. So a very exciting place to be. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, so I'm gonna call on Beryl Ann Mark to introduce herself as well as um, the group she co-founded, Women's Leadership Group. Marilyn, if you would like to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marilyn Mark um, and I live in the Parkdale community for the past uh, 26 years. Um, a couple of years ago, we, a group of colored women in our community bonded together and started a, um, a women leadership group and uh, the purpose of starting a group was to help uh, women in the community with the mental health, to help them be maintain being mentally stable. Um, 
and of course, you know, we didn't want to leave anyone behind. So we include men also in our activities or our gathering. Um, one of the things that we did is, um, so what we did is we, as women, we bonded together to, um, to take action, action to fight for equal rights and justice. Um, <laughs> in, our, you know, in our community, of course, and hopefully it uh, will lead to far and wider. Um, and so what we did, we did, um, uh, uh, and out of that, we, we did um, a leadership training series. Um, and out of that um, leadership training series, I think um, Berlan has been frozen. I don't know if that's for others, but just me. Yeah, I see that as well. Okay. We are reaching out to women in our community, reaching out to people in the community to um, just, just, you know, to see how they're doing. So we do avoid three trucks. So that's where we are right now with these uh, women you know, who had attended uh, some of our, the activities that we provided in our community, such as tea making, yoga exercises. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berylan. Um, next, I'd like to call on Dimitri O'K uh, to speak a little bit about the work that, about Milton Park Citizens Committee. Thank you, Dimitri. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, hi everyone. I'm having trouble with my, my camera. Uh, but um, yes, I'm a first generation immigrant from Greece originally, and I teach at Vanya College, which I wanted to just say that it's situated on traditional and unceded territory, right? So of uh, Kanyan Keaka. So um, basically my, my, uh, my courses usually involve um, activism, uh, social justice, and uh, focus on literature and, and social justice. So uh, the mutual aid, aid network at Milton Park was like a chance for me to, to sort of get all these uh, issues that I was dealing with in class to sort of find a practice for them, an actual practice. And we started uh, in April um, working together, serving meals every Sunday, giving PPE, grocery coupons, things like that, plants as well. And uh, it's sort of growing and, and we're getting... I feel like we're starting to connect more with people, which was sort of, uh, which is kind of a, a, the, the, the result of it. At first it was just the practical aspect. And then now it's starting to feel uh, deeper and getting more connected. And as we're getting together, we, we're, more often we, we are discussing the purpose of what we're doing and the political implications of what we're doing. So I feel like uh, it's sort of an awakening for me personally because I'm just getting away from academia and from thinking about it and teaching it, which is one one side of it, uh, but also being able to practice it and 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 make a difference, uh, even if it's limited, even if it's you know it's nuanced and so on. But uh, yeah, I'm very happy uh, sort of to be going through that with with everyone in the in the neighborhood. Thank you so much, Dimitri, and thank you for sharing a bit about Milton Park Citizens Committee. Um, I'd like to call on Sue Tarty to speak about her work with uh, Solidarité Milton Park. Sue, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. Hi there, everyone. Um, so my name is Sue Tardif. I'm a white settler mother of French, Irish, and British ancestry. Um, originally growing up in the Nahiawak and Anasini Napak uh, Dakota, Lakota and Nakota lands, um, and also the homeland of the Metis Michif Nation. So that would be, you would know those lands as um, Southern Saskatchewan or Treaty 4 territory as well. So um, since 2015, uh, I've been working as, a, as an advocate for uh, people in the neighborhood who are marginalized. I live in the Milton Park neighborhood. I live in a co-op as part of the land trust. Um, and since 2015, we have been um, connecting directly with people primarily in the, in the homeless community here, 
uh, and the people in that community are 90 to 95% First Nations and Inuit, um, along with people who have immigrated to Canada or come to Canada as refugees from countries that have been colonized. Um, so we are an anti-colonial, anti-capitalist uh, based set of grassroots initiatives and we're very much values based. So um, for the people that work with us, it's not, we don't just like have anybody that comes to work with us. We really ask that people are committed to decolonizing their mind, to really like understanding how our minds have been conditioned and colonized under white supremacy. Um, that's a super important thing for us. We're not interested in the white savior thing. We're not interested, we're not non-interventionist. We don't tell people what to do. We really, um, what we did in 2015 is we just went to people and set people on the street and said, hey, look, there's people that wanna support you in some way. A, do you want that support? Uh, informed consent is a huge important thing in, in mutual aid. And, and B, if you want that consent, if you, if, if you would like our support, what would that look like? And so people told us um, that uh, their food was a, a problem on Saturdays. And so we just started making a hot meal um, that we could have together. So, but, and that we move around, we move around with it. We don't stay in one place. So that meal share really informs all of then the educational projects that we've worked on since then. And the educational projects are anti-colonial and anti-capitalist in, um, in nature. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue, for introducing us to your work on Solidarité. Um, I'd like to introduce um, or ask Desiree to speak a little bit more about the work she's doing with uh, Coming Together Vancouver. And uh, Josh, you can definitely go to that next slide you were just at. Um, yeah, Desiree, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, everyone again. Um, yeah, I just popped the link to the Coming Together Vancouver website in case anybody's interested in looking um, into its operations further so. Um, as I mentioned, it was initiated at the onset of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and it was, uh, it was a bunch of organizers who were working together beforehand to address inequality, to address the climate crises. And they saw this moment uh, as something that could either further entrench us in those in that inequity or it could be something that would um, reignite our communities and our neighborhoods. Um, so I've been, as I said, uh, just outside of Vancouver in so-called Langley, BC, um, doing work in alliance with Coming Together Vancouver. Um, and what that has looked like primarily is hosting an online platform in which um, neighbors and community members can connect to one another, um, especially emphasizing uh, support for those who are most vulnerable in our communities. And this has ended up looking like the, the main concerns I, I feel like we've seen throughout the pandemic have been surrounding um, poverty and food security, um, mental health, and also racism. And so those are some, some takeaways of things that um, the community has needed to address together and to find solutions, um, to find innovative solutions and quickly. And I think what that has taught us is that even though we're moving to address these big global crises like the pandemic and the climate crises, um, there are people in our communities and in our society whose basic needs are not being met. And so it feels really off to talk about um, addressing these wider things without focusing on the people uh, who are most impacted and on that note, also, um, as Sue was just mentioning, you know, um, honoring the agency that these people have. Um, we're not to come into these arenas as outsiders and define solutions for these communities. Um, rather, they have the solutions um, that they know will work best for them, um, for their neighbors, for their families. And so, it's been a really interesting process of like stepping back 
um, and acknowledging that and again um, having to ensure that like we're not only talking about decolonizing um, we're not only talking about uh, moving in a different direction of capitalism but we're actually on the grounds doing the grassroots work with the people that are next door to us so i would say that's kind of been like the overview of lessons uh taken away from from that work and it's really exciting to see people come together um to share resources and information and support and love like the love <laughs> that has been uh sprouting in so many different forms is um phenomenal and that that is what we need to heal um the injustices of the past and present state thank you so much desiree um, something that we tend to do, we've gotten to do in Mutual Aid Parkdale is tell each other that we love each other. Um, so I know, I think that Ali Khan started that and it was really beautiful and it felt real and wonderful. Um, so for our next topic, what I was hoping to do is get speakers to delve a little bit more into the specific activities that their networks are into and reflect how those, activity, how, how those activities uh, show mutual aid values and principles. And so first off, I'd like to call on Ali Khan Pabini. Um, Ali Khan, can you introduce yourself um, as well as to speak about some of activities you're, you've been doing in Mutual Aid Parkdale? And also Emily Brotman and Teresa Padua, if you'd like to chime in, please do. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Ali Khan if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, Teresa, would it be okay if, uh, if Emily just went before myself just because of kind of like the flow of the sure, what we, of course. What we were talking about? Yeah, beautiful, sorry Thanks about so that. Much. Do you um, want to introduce yourself first, and then we can then we can get into it. Oh, uh, sure, okay. sure, yeah, sure. Um, Great, thanks. So Steve. my um, my name is Ali Khan. Um, I go by province um, in Indian and um, I'm a Siamese land. Ali Khan, I, I wonder. I'm sorry, part Ali. Of the, part of Mutual Parkdale. I also work with the Parkdale Land Trust and Park. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I can't hear anything. Sorry, Ali Khan, I think that you are, um, your Wi-Fi is a bit unstable. Do you think you can take yourself off of camera to maybe help to stabilize it? Hello? Oh, oh sure. Okay, so, is that better? Yes, I can hear you. Are you able to hear? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did you hear anything I said, or should I start over? <laughs> can you start over? Sorry, Ali Khan. Yeah, sure, sure, no problem. Uh, so my name is Ali Khan Pabani. I'm uh, I go by uh, he him pronouns, and I am, I'm of Indian ancestry, uh, and so I'm a settler on these lands. I work with Mutual Aid Parkdale and uh, um, all. Also with Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust and Park, uh, so I do tenant organizing um, with 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 uh, the the PNLT and Park, also independently in the community. Um, also a musician, play the drums and piano and guitar, and then a few musical groups. And yeah, that's pretty much me. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Ali. Emily, did you want to start us off? Yeah. So I think. The way Ali Khan and I decided to go about this is to actually start from the, the values and principles of mutual aid as, as we currently understand them, and then show how those values play out in some of our work. And I'll try and be really specific and concrete. Um, so one of, one of the core principles um, of, our, of mutual aid and of our group in particular is zero judgment, which is and it, an idea that I heard echoed in what Desiree said and what Sue said, um, it's basically the idea that uh, everyone is deserving of support and that each person is the expert of their own life. Um, each person knows what they need. And so we trust our neighbors um, to make decisions for themselves. And being non-judgmental is how we honor everyone's and everyone's right to self-determination. 
So an example of how this plays out, when we purchase and deliver groceries for people who are trying to self-isolate, um, maybe they are older or they have a health condition that makes them um, extra vulnerable to COVID, um, we, we trust our neighbors um, that they're asking for what they need. We don't ask prying questions. We never make judgments about um, things that they're requesting. We encourage people to ask for everything that they need. And often we have to push people to actually tell us everything that they need. And because they're very, if they hold back, they don't want to ask for too much. So we actually have to push people to say, uh, to, to tell us everything that they need. And uh, we never would say anything like, oh, you know, you don't actually need that. We don't make decisions like that on, on other people's behalf. Um, so we, we meet all the requests that we can. Um, and so that's one way that zero judgment plays out in that work. Something else that we've started to get involved in um, more recently is encampment support. And uh, by that I mean supporting unhoused people who are currently living in encampments. And these are some of the people who are uh, perhaps most impacted by COVID-19 right now. Um, so some concrete ways that we support our um, unhoused neighbors is by showing up in large numbers when they're being evicted, um, offering to be there if they want us to be there when there's any interaction with um, the city or police or streets to home staff who come to um, provide temporary housing. Um, and one way that zero judgment plays out in that kind of work is we, um, for example, we will support someone who turns down an offer of shelter or housing um, because we trust that if they're turning that down, there's a good reason why they would rather stay in the encampment than go into somewhere indoors. Um, and sometimes that's a matter of um, that offer of housing being very far from an area where community and where they're, what they're familiar with. It may be that um, they feel safer outside than in a shelter, a crowded shelter, or even in a shared apartment space. So that's one example where, um, an example of how we live out the value of zero judgment. Um, and I just wanna make sure that we're giving, for this uh, encampment support work, giving credit to the encampment support network um, some of us recently teamed up with that group. They're a self-organized neighborhood-based group, and they focus solely on supporting unhoused people. Um, that group is connected to hum uh, community health centers and outreach workers who are woefully underfunded right now. Um, and so that's just, hopefully that's, uh, those are some clear examples of the work that we're doing in that area. Um, and I want to go back to talking about the groceries that we have been purchasing and delivering for our neighbors because that so far has been the bulk of our mutual aid um, work. And that came out of uh, being in a state of emergency. That was our emergency response. Um, it started at a time when there was a lot of uncertainty, um, a lot of fear about the pandemic. People were trying to stay home as much as possible. And we knew some people were more vulnerable than others. But as we've gotten more organized and as we've had more meetings among pod leaders, we've had the opportunity to really reflect on our values. And we've actually decided recently um, to transition slowly away from grocery delivery and purchase towards other projects that might be more mutual and um, more reciprocal for the support and allowing us to challenge the existing power structure of there being someone who gives support and a different person who receives support. So trying to mix that up so that everyone um, is able to give support and everyone's able to receive support. Um, sort of putting the mutual back into mutual aid. And so the uh, value that's been animating this shift in the work that we're doing is the idea of solidarity, not charity. 
Um, and I began to explain what that means, but I'm going to hand it over to Ali Khan to talk a little bit more about what we mean when we say solidarity, not charity. Um, and from reflecting on that value, where we might be headed in the future. Uh, thanks so much. I, I think my Wi-Fi signal is doing a little bit better now. So if, if uh, my voice isn't cutting out, then I'm just going to continue with video. But please stop me if for some reason I start cutting out. Um, I'm going to echo a, a few things that, uh, that Emily said. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, with regards to solidarity and not charity. So I think um, what we've been discussing is that this is a concept of kind of like a a horizontal type of support as opposed to vertical culture. Um, and, uh, and not unidirectional, but rather reciprocal. So everyone is valued, everyone has something to offer. Um, and so another, another aspect of this kind of framework is that um, it typically is not heavily reliant or at all reliant on outside funding or outside support from like governmental systems or um, as Teresa alluded to earlier, the NGO complex. Um, and therefore it's not susceptible to being directed by outside forces in that sense. Um, another thing that uh, kind of arises from, from this mentality of um, mutual aid and, and solidarity, not charity, is uh, the key skills that are seen as valuable once you make that, that shift. So some of the key skills when, when you're reliant on outside funding, for instance, would be things like, you know, grant writing or report writing or compiling documents um, and, and uh, what can be seen as valuable in this case would be your proximity to power and power structures. Um, but uh, from my experience, uh, I, think, I think that uh, some of the skills that are brought out in this latter, um, more horizontal approach tends to lead more towards um, relationship building as being valued uh, as something that is um, moves the moves the needle forward. Um, your communication skills, and instead of your proximity to power, it becomes your proximity to your community and your neighbors. Uh, um, so, I'd just like to go over some concrete examples of what is what I think distribution of power, because this is like kind of a very kind of. Uh, general thing that may not necessarily um, be explicit in, in what it means. So I just want to give a few examples and I'll start with some internal examples. So redistribution of power, um, I think that it can not necessarily mean um, hard power. It can also mean soft power. And the way that I, I wanted to divide it up is, is an example of internal um, redistribution of power in the workings that uh, in which we conduct our, our group and our meetings and, and our organization and external uh, redistribution of power. So an example of internal redistribution of power is uh, something we've uh, been working on is a uh, developing a media task force in order to uplift the voices of those who are uh, typically um, stifled or left behind. Um, the media task force is something that we've done in order to encourage each other to, to be leaders and to speak for the group, to the media, to um, documentarists, to, to like an out, our outward facing story should be told by those whose voices are typically left behind or stifled in some way. And that, that's not just something where you can kind of just allow to happen. You need to put work into that. Uh, so what we've been doing is reaching out to those who are more often given these opportunities and are more comfortable with public speaking and and in their their uh, and and because of their privilege and whatever 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 reasons it may be and to have these people encourage those who are not of that category to become to to become more confident and speak for the group and really really um, develop leadership skills through collaboration. Um, so that's kind of an example of how we take uh, redistribution of power seriously internally. Um, an exam a few examples of external redist redistribution of power can mean some of the more long-term projects that mutual aid is working on. To take back power from these institutions that oppress us, these capitalist institutions that oppress us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Teresa alluded to taking back specifically um, 
the concept of community health and safety. So some examples of that in mutual aid on the ground might look like setting up like an eviction defense net, which can look like neighbors getting together and showing up for each other when the state comes down to try and remove them from their homes. This uh, does not rely on the landlord tenant or part of the um, NGO complex. It really literally just relies on our neighbors to show up for us so that we can rely on each other. Uh, another example will be creating an alternative to calling the police. Um, that's no, no uh, joking, that's no laughing matter. That takes a lot of work. Um, it, some of these things, some of these ideas require initial injections of funding, but in the long term, it, the hopes are that they could be more self-sustaining. But so an, creating an alternative call to calling the police um, when folks are in mental health crisis or in conflict generally requires a lot of skills, requires a lot of de-escalation skills. So it's a very concerted effort to create something that the community can trust and, and look to instead of looking to the oppressive uh, police forces that often end up escalating and ends up in tragedy um, a lot of the time. Another example would be um, like a, a peer support uh, network where those who simply just want to um, talk uh, or go through some of the issues they're having or just having a listening ear for whatever it is um, can go a long way in terms of someone's uh, mental well-being and we see that as very important and that's something that also requires quite a bit of training but is a self-sustaining long-term goal. Um, community gardens, uh, that's something that doesn't require, um, except for per perhaps initially an, an initial investment, but is in, at the end of the day, self-sustaining, does not require on donate, does not require donations or purchases or anything like that. And it builds community power in that sense. Um, sorry, I, I think I'm going on a little bit long, so I'm just going to end it there. But uh, yeah, again, I just, I really appreciate uh, being amongst such a diverse and amazing uh, group of organizers. And thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ali Khan, for sharing those concrete examples that really do um, allow us to understand how mutual aid gets practice on the ground. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Samuel Moal Gale, as well as Nathan McDonald, to share a little bit about their practices on the ground in uh, Milton Park, the Citizens Committee. Um, I'm not sure who would like to go first. You can just chime in. Samuel, go right ahead. I'll let Nathan take it away first. Okay, Nathan. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, and please remember to introduce yourself, Nathan, as you're speaking yeah. for the first time. Good point, good point. Um, can you hear me okay? You hear me yes, okay? we can hear you perfectly. Great, so uh, just before I start, I, I wanna say that I have a stutter, so that, that's why sometimes I, I, I may talk l like that. Um, I, I go by he, I'm originally from Australia, I'm half, my ancestry is half Lebanese and half um, 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 Irish. Um, and I've, I, I've been active as a community activist in Milton Park in Montreal for the last um, 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 five years, active in the Milton Park Citizens Committee. Um, and also I'm involved with the um, with the um, um, radical publishing company um, 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 Black Rose Books, and uh, we published by uh, uh, speaking of which, this book on mutual aid by Peter Kropotkin, and and we've published the collected works of Kropotkin. So you can check that out. Um, uh, so I'll talk a bit about the politics of where we're coming at um quickly so like the um the and, and of course i speak about this kind of in our ideal like this is like what this is why us as the core organizers are involved but of course we're not perfect in kind of mm, um articulating that in in our practice but but we're learning but for for, for me uh, um the politics of, of why we do mutual aid is to build alternatives to capitalism and the s state, um, because and because I and and I I think it's about like building grassroots, like to to build in a culture of grassroots self 
management. Um, and it, uh, I think it, I think this is very much a that uh, like um, it 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 is certainly about supporting needs of uh, yes yeah, so, so, so supporting needs in the community, but it's also about l learning like learning how to do community learning how to help each other learning to cooperate and not count on the s s state or hierarchical um, uh, um, um, organizations. And like, I, I include m myself, like I, I'm very much l learning from this process. Um, and uh, yeah, and, 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 and just before I hand it over to Samuel, some questions um, that our group has been having, and, and I look forward to hearing more from from the others, uh, what, what they think is, how do we make sure um, that we don't fall into into um, 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 charity? Um, um, how do we connect our material solidarity with broader um, political s struggles to transform society and challenge um, the oppressive power s structure? And how do we talk about mm, um, mm, politics and do poli like political education in a way that's accessible and like in in a way that brings politics into our everyday lives and, and into the community. Samuel. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Samuel Moyer Gale. I'm a political science and Canadian studies student at McGill, uh, where I mainly research uh, left wing and labor movements in the Caribbean and in East Central Europe. And I've been working with a mutual aid group as a volunteer in some capacities. Uh, again, I'd just like to thank everybody who's on this panel because they've really started to nail down what I think we'll get to when we have these breakout groups a little bit later. But as for the material needs of people and the material help that we can provide, I think a lot of people who have already spoken really, like I said, hit the nail on the head. And what we've started to do now as we move forward past the pandemic and the planning stages of it is try to look at like Nathan said, how we create those spaces to be spaces of learning and not learning as we know it now in hierarchical institutions, but rather to teach people or reteach people that learning is all about sharing what you know. And like it was mentioned by, I'm not sure who a little bit earlier, people really are the masters of their own lives and they know well, maybe with a little bit of help or a guidance, what they need and how to get it. And it's all about trying to open up those spaces leading with knowledge and education. So what we've started to do just yesterday, actually, we had a first reading group that was connected to our mutual aid group. The idea of that was really, we looked at a piece that I think is mentioned also earlier, Solidarity Not Charity by Dean Spade, just to ground ourselves in what kinds of mutual aid work there are around the world, and especially in this you know, North American context. And going forward, we also spent part of the discussion talking about what it meant for us to do mutual aid, what kind of a group we were, were we anti-capitalists or were we socialists, you know, we wanted to, and we do want to, as we go on, craft an image for us so that when we open these spaces of popular education, of uh, cultural um, open air cinemas of documentaries, we don't just want to, or rather we want to avoid potentially people showing up as neighbors to connect their neighbors, but that's where the buck stops. We really want to take the extra step and show people that like Nathan said, there's a reality for us where we can construct several of these spaces, overlapping concentric circles. They don't have to provide everything, but that we can do it ourselves and be a serious alternative to the state. And at that reading group, it was mentioned that people nowadays much, find it much easier to envision the end of everything than the end of capitalism. And I can't remember it off the top of my head, but there's that Ursula K. Le Guin quote that talks about the fact that people are always so resistant to changing the status quo, to resist it now to people envisioning the end of capitalism as people were to envision the end of fealties and kings and 
the PT bourgeoisie and aristocracy. The fact is, we're so stuck in this rut. And what's essential, especially in our mutual aid work to do, is making sure we rebuild these uh, connections, as again, I'm echoing somebody said before, to show that that's who we can uh, count on, our neighbors, the people we know. It's not, I scratch my back, you, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. It's, I'm helping you because helping you is helping me. Um, I think I'm also going on a little bit long, but I'll just end with a quote that comes from Murray Bookchin, who is influential, I think, in the planning of our, well, certainly my thought, uh, which is that the goal is to first democratize, in our case, our commonwealth, our republic, whatever. And then this goal afterwards is to radicalize that democracy. And I think the best thing, even if us amongst people in mutual aid uh, have different ideas of how to get, how to go forward, what route to take, the why is always the same. People know why they're doing it. Uh, so the how is on the back burner because what matters is that at the base, we stand together uh, as neighbors and frankly as people. Thank you, Samuel, it's very powerful. Thank you, Nathan and Samuel from the Milton Park Citizens Committee. Um, I wanted to invite Bera Lan uh, from the Women's Leadership Group in Parkdale. Um, if, if, you have, if you'd like to speak on the activities that the, um, the leadership group have been organizing over the years and how these activities have impacted the community. Bera Lan, if you wanted to um, touch on these, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Can Hi you hear me now? Yes, we can hear yeah, you. I had to, you. Sorry about that. I had to use my phone, um, but I could see from the screen from my computer. Um, I, want, I, I'm, I just want to take us back to a little bit to starting our Women Leadership Series. Um, you know, we had some women from uh, different uh, endeavors in their work, whether it was grassroots or, or their own business or community um, tenants organizing came to speak about the work that they did and that empowered us to um to do to start something in our community but so we brainstormed and we came up with the idea with, that we need uh to help people with their well-being because we know when people are mentally stable when they feel good about who they are we could get them to go there and uh you know and fight back and so we that's where our group started we brought it out of starting our women leadership group. And out of our women leadership group, we knew we wanted, we had to do, we brainstorm on what some of the things we could do to, you know, for, to help us with our end result. Um, so we did some uh, training series, which like, like I mentioned before, was on uh, suicide prevention. So we want, because the space we were going to create it, we want to know that, you know, if certain issues arise with people who we were um, doing different activities with, if they come to us, uh, you know, to help them, we wanted to know we were prepared. So we did uh, this training, we even created a zine on harm reduction, how to prevent and respond to if somebody is uh, have an opioid overdose, because we didn't know who was going to come into that space. Um, and, uh, you know, we even did on active listening uh, with, um, and effective communication, where we w want to be able to communicate uh, effectively with people um, in that space. Um, so we our session, which um, well, a three hour session um, where, you know, we mix and mingle for the first hour, you know, first hour and, uh, you know, um, uh, eat. And so we had food in the space and, you know, just, you know, talking about different, you know, just opening up about, you know, what we, you know, how our week was or, you know, just breaking the ice a bit. And then the one we went, the second session, we went into doing the activities. And then the last hour, we wanted to have a space where, you know, people wanted to talk about different things that they're dealing with. Um, we're, they were, um, we're there to help them. So, um, and of course, uh, eventually, uh, we initially we were going to do that, our activities for two months. But after um, we completed it, people wanted to continue wanted the sessions to continue. So we cut back on some hours, depending on different things, and then we were able to continue for two more months. But of course the pandemic hit. And uh, so what we are doing now, we're gonna, um, we wanna open up the training to um, other women 
in the community, or I should say other people if men want to be included, also we don't leave anyone behind. Um, open it up to people in our community so they, you know, they could be at the same level that we're on, so we're having a ripple effect. And from then, um, we're going to be having this, some of the same activities that we did, um, like we did knitting with these women, um, we did uh, card making, we, um, we made uh, uh, tea, um, we had the, did yoga exercises. So we, we just did all these different activities to help people in, with their well-being. So because we know once people are feeling good about who they are, like I said, um, we are able to go there in our community and help others, have the strength, have the, you know, have the resources to help others in our community. So I just wanted to share that uh, with, so in the meantime, what we're doing, we were co um, having conversations uh, with uh, uh, the participants of uh, our program so that uh, we weren't we ready to be up and running again. Uh, you know, everybody is prepared. and. Uh, Thank you. So that's my take on it. Thank you so much, um, Verilan. Yeah, Very powerful work in Parkdale. Also, just to note in the chat box, Mercedes Sharp Zayas has um, included a link to the zine created by the Women's Leadership Group on harm reduction. Please check it out. It is amazing. Um, I wanted to invite up next Sue Tartif uh, to speak about the work in Solidarité uh, Milton Park. Sue, if you want to unmute yourself and speak about some of the practices, the concrete practices that um, your group is engaging in and how this reflects mutual aid practices or values. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I think the first thing that's important for, um, for me to say is that when we started it, you know, this, this is a process. This is not a, a perfect thing, right? We come together and we all just want to be non-discriminatory and and inclusive and all of that and things are a lot more complicated than that um and so it is a it is a situation right, and has been a, situ a process for us of establishing relationships of working within um kind of the conflictual power structures that we've kind of been conditioned in even as activists to compete there's ego issues in activism in a big way my own included um, so it's a question of being mindful of those kind of things um, and really this idea of solidarity, not charity for us. It's super important. Again, it starts in each individual mind in each one of our minds, this idea of charity, because we can say solidarity, not charity, and we can have good intentions, absolutely good intentions of that. Um, but if we've still got these kind of conditioned tapes, am I still going here? Do people still hear me? Yes, you can. Hi, Sue. Um, I don't hear you right now, but we could hear you before. Okay. There we go. We can hear you. Yes. All right. We got you. So, so yeah, so as a start, starting point, um, it, you know, for, for us, it starts with us individually, and that's long-term work. That's life work. You know, I have 50 years of conditioning under white supremacy as a privileged white woman, so that's every day regular practice and we we talk about these things in terms of these are a practice humility is not just a thing it's a practice um you know practicing not taking up space for someone like me is a practice um so th those are important things for us um so this saturday meal share that we started um serves as us being able to connect with people on a relational level um, we are building relationships with people with their informed consent. And that's super important because we have the NGO industrial complex, we have the social services and health institutional complexes that force care, which is not care, but it's coercive care that coerce people into care. If somebody tells me to fuck off, I'm going to fuck off. That's kind of the way that, that, you know, that we do it. Um, and that's, again, super important. Um, we know that the government's not going to come and save us. We know that capitalism requires homelessness as a model to be afraid of for the rest of us so that we go and do our terrible jobs that make us feel awful and make us sick, but we're afraid to end up on the street like the people we see. So because of that, we reject all of these kind of campaigns about glossy, you know, folders of happy, smiling, homeless people, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, we, we kind of reject that as well. Um, and for us, 
mutual aid and community are the same thing. Um, you know, community is capacity. When, when you're doing something and you want to contribute and another person comes and says, wow, that sounds amazing. And I'd really like to help you in that. How can I, how can I support you in that? That gives people capacity. Um, and especially people who are targets of colonial capitalism, especially people who are marginalized under a white supremacist system. Um, this is extremely important and we can do that. We can connect and, and, um, and be there for each other, as other people have said, right? So hu humility, dealing with your ego, etc. So the meal share is, a, is, a, is how we consult with people. And that informs the next initiatives that we do in terms of on the street support, particularly with virus support. We do a, an informal cop watch um, because we know that specifically if white people are watching police intervention and do it in a proper, again, informed consent way where possible, um, the police behave differently, at least for that period of time. We're working on concepts of radical neighboring, um, which is basically just going for walks in the community, having some material support with you that we are putting together backpacks with the consultation of the people in the unsheltered community who have told us what they need on evenings and weekends. And so we're, we're starting this radical neighboring initiative and web of trust initiative where people are just going for walks in the community, but with the intention of being helpful, right? And again, really pushing back against the charity, look at me, white saviorism kind of thing. You know, it's like if I'm on the street and I help somebody with their groceries, um, I'm not gonna then take a selfie of us and post it on Facebook and say, look what a great person I am that I'm doing this, right? It's neighboring. And the radical part is that we're not requiring that people in the unsheltered community go away. We're trying to say what, what material stuff can we provide and what emotional support and presence, just a presence, listening presence can we provide? So, yeah. Thank you so much, Sue, it was very powerful. Um, I'm gonna call on, thank you all to the speakers. We've spoken um, and really, really shared, created collective knowledge about what is mutual aid, both concrete and thinking about the values um, and the politics of mutual aid. Next, um, we're hoping to have a bit of an overview of the community land trust model, as well as the cooperative uh, model from Nathan McDonald. Nathan, he organizes in Milton Park, which hosts the largest community housing project, project on a community land trust in North America. Nathan, I'm going to keep you on time because we are, we are just, you know, moving. We want to keep at least 30 minutes at the end of it to have a group discussion. So I'm going to keep you watch for, for about five minutes. Thank you so much, Nathan. Perfect. I know, so I know, much. sorry. I was just saying, I know also you have some slide decks. Uh, Joshua, if we can move to Nathan's slide deck that he, he offered. Go ahead, Nathan. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to try to do this as strictly as possible in five minutes. It's hard because uh, we, we gave a presentation a few weeks ago for an hour and a half on this topic. So I'm going to try to condense um, it. Nathan, yep. I don't see your slides. I, I'm on the online thing and I don't see them there. Are they there? Did you put them into the online? Yep. Yep. So I, I put them in. If you can't see them, I could share from my screen. Yeah. Do you want to share your screen? I'll stop my share. Okay, so present. Now I have to go to Zoom to share my screen, right? Uh, can you, um, it says that share screening is not en Engaged. enabled. So if, if, if you could en enable share screening for part participants. I, I, um, I've just uh, made you a, a host, so you should okay, be able to do it great. now. Perfect, perfect, great. So there we go. Um, so, uh, this so um okay yeah so 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 um so i i've got here just a, a short kind of summarized slideshow of a presentation we did a few weeks ago which was called um evicting our landlords a crash course on housing co-ops and community land um trusts if you want the full slideshow you can click that link i'm also going to post it. i've also got it in the chat um, um maybe i'll post it yeah i'll post it after i finish speaking um so 
Um, so basically, um, co-ops and land trusts, it's about the democratic and collective ownership uh, of land and housing. Um, and I certainly see it as like a, a, a tool to, a tool to build a, to go, a tool to build a, a post capitalist um, form of ownership and management of land and housing to get things off the market. Certainly these things are not new because for most of human history in most pre-capitalist societies, there's no concept of private um, property. And I see c community land trusts and co-ops as a way for us in our modern capitalist societies to try to bring back that collective communal um, control, which is extremely hard. Like I've said for now, it's extremely hard in, in, in the current situation of hot markets. Um, so just a very quick thing on land trusts. So land trusts are, um, it, are, are about the collective ownership of the land. So that can be used for all sorts of things. Um, in rural areas, it's usually used for ecology and agriculture. Um, so you, you can kind of think of it as like a community owned national park, for example. In urban areas, it's usually used for housing. Um, it can also be used for um, commercial spaces, heritage, all sorts of things like that. Um, so the origins of it, um, so here, here on this slide, um, John Davis, who's known as the grandfather of CLTs, he He's developed a lot of materials about the history of CLTs, and he really grounds the origins of CLTs in the civil rights movement in the states where African American activists saw the um, control of land as an essential part of them building economic, um, economic um, independence and um, e empowerment. Um, so you can, uh, click those things there to get more information. Um, um, there's there's um, lots of different forms of community land trust. They're certainly not homogenous. Um, and in Canada, there's a, of course, like the organization that's hosting this talk is the Canadian Network of Community Land Trusts. Um, yeah, and there's 25 different projects in Canada, most of which, most of which are in development. Um, in terms of housing co-ops, um, housing co-ops are, are um, cooperative, um, cooperative, um, yeah, they, they, they're a way for the people who live in housing to co cooperatively own and manage their housing. Um, again, there's lots of different models um, across the world. I would say that it, it's important to know that uh, that there's very different, like both with both land trusts and housing co-ops, um, there's there many different models, and lots of those models I personally would strongly um, um, cr um, 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 critique um, because um, at times they're led by um, professional. Nonprofits and and not by grassroots um, um, citizens, and also even sometimes they can promote kind of private, um, private, um, private, um, private um, um, ownership of housing, and often that's because, especially in North America, we really don't have enough money for coming in from the state to finance these things. So often uh, groups are forced to resort to private ownership. Um, in Quebec, it's a very, it's not really like that. Um, and I'm just going to quickly speak about Milton Park as an example. So um, there was a community struggle to save the neighborhood in the 19, 1960s, to save the neighborhood from being knocked down and it formed the Milton Park community which is a federation of 22 co-ops and non-profit housing and the important thing is it's taken 
six blocks of downtown Montreal off the private market and put it in grassroots community control. Um, all the co-ops don't have staff. They're all led by um, volunteers who live in the co-ops and the nonprofits serve mainly um, marginalized populations. And it's an overall population of 1,500 who live in the land trust. And we also have 10 uh, commercial, um, commercial properties that are community owned. Um, so I think, I think the probably used, uh, uh, how's my time? You're, you're a little over one minute. Right. Perfect. Well, I'm done. Beautiful. Thank you, Milton. <laughs> That's an amazing, I mean, thank you, uh, Nathan. Thank you. That was amazing. Very amazing. Um, so I'm going to call on Ali Khan and Sue to offer some of the insights that we discussed in particular, um, this group met previously. And we had discussions about the community land trust model um, with respect to uh, mutual aid practices and values. And so I'm going to call on Ali Khan to unmute himself. If he can give a little bit of an overview of the debates that emerged during those discussions, as well as the lines of um, inquiry that we animated as a collective. Um, Ali Khan, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Ali. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so yeah, some of the things I'm, I'm going to say might seem a bit controversial and like they're contradicting uh, what, what Nathan has said, uh, but I'd like to stress that this is a debate. So I, I don't mean to sound combative. I'm going to try and rush through this as much as I can in the interest of time. Uh, I'd like to preface this by saying that I work with the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust and I very much support the work that uh, we do. Um, this is not um, bad faith criticism. I just want to go over some of the uh, criticisms um, that that have been um, attributed to the, the land trust model um, in, through, through an anti-capitalist uh, lens. So some of these criticisms can be and are mitigated uh, uh, by, by this model. Some of them, however, are more fundamentally, for month, fundamental and inherent in the structure of this model and cannot be mitigated, okay? So um, one thing that has come up already is this need for continue, and even uh, Nathan alluded to it, uh, is this continuous need for outside funding, whether it be from gov governmental organizations, NGOs, nonprofit sector, that kind of thing. Now this leaves um, the, uh, it, it leaves uh, land trusts and, and, and co-ops and, and such um, net networks susceptible to co-optation, um, unfortunately. Uh, it, it also uh, is more kind of like a top-down uh, charitable type of approach as opposed to a horizontal kind of solidarity um, uh, type of approach. So unit, unit directional uh, support. Um, and now what, what this uh, funding structure ends up doing in turn in some, in some cases, in a lot of cases, um, is that it attracts uh, people with a certain type of skill set, like skill set in grant writing, um, uh, creating reports, that kind of thing, a professional class of folks that end up, albeit making, making albeit dem democratic decisions or decentralized decisions, but on, on behalf of often working class people. So you have this pro professional class that are making decisions on behalf of working class people and they are accountable to their funders. Um, now, whether, whether the land trust uh, it, or particular land trust or core model is being responsive to the community or not, at the end of the day, their existence and their continued existence does rely on outside funding and therefore they are at the end of the day accountable to their fund funders. Now, that is not necessarily a bad thing. However, some of the results of this uh, setup can mean that um, radical activity um, is maybe suppressed a little bit and or not prioritized, not put in the forefront, because mm -hmm. funders often are looking for quantifiable data, tangible data that that shows that their funding is going somewhere and that you know it's it's being used in an appropriate way. They're often less concerned with um, intangible things like building capacity, radical capacity, um, building relationships amongst the community. Now, this is a this is can be mitigated and is in many cases, but this is something that, uh, that has been pointed out as an issue with this model. Um, another another uh, criticism is that, and I, I, I'm sorry to contradict you, uh, Nathan, uh, but 
it, it is it is still privately held property. It's it's not technically owned by the public. Um, now we can we can debate over whether or not the land trusts and co-ops are, are acting in the interests of the community. But one thing that is not debatable is that it's not owned by the public. It it it, it can be controlled by the public, um, but it's not owned by the public. Um, as in it's not public property and therefore it exists within the capitalist structure. This makes it fundamentally different than the goals of mutual aid in that sense, that particular sense. While these two categories have shared goals, this is one that is fundamental difference. It is within, working within the capitalist framework in order to, in many cases, slow the bleed of gentrification. It does very, very good work on the ground however it is, and it is private property. Now, the government that likes to come in and, and announce funding initiatives for this, uh, this um, model right before election time, often uh, NDP and uh, green governments or uh, parties will come in and say, we will give all this money to, to this uh, land trust or to this um, co-op and whatnot. And they'll call it, they'll, they'll deliberately use words like community controlled instead of using the word publicly owned. And that is intentional. I'd just like to point that out. Um, it, it, it's very intentional language um, because publicly owned requires a much larger um, and sustained level of funding for the purpose of transferring and property from to the sector. That's not what they what they're doing in these election promises. They're talking about quote unquote con community controlled, which has a, like a vague definition, versus publicly owned, which has a scientific definition. Um, so just to, just to end it off uh, really quick, I do think that um, there are many shared goals between these two models, the, the mutual aid model and the uh, neighborhood land trust model. However, I do think that there are also very, very sharp divisions. And I think we need to be careful about the liberation between these two things. They can, they can exist uh, separately and they can benefit each other. However, in some ways they are fundamentally opposed on the level of values and uh, stated principles. Uh, I'm just going to end it there, but I hope that this sparks uh, a good debate on, on the issues uh, that we've talked about. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ali Khan, for giving a summary of our discussions on the contradictions and um, thinking through the, these two different models. I want to ask Sue. Sue, did you want to chime in and add anything? I know also you are working quite close to um, the Milton Park uh, the co-op, so you might have a, um, a great perspective as well. Yeah, hi. Yeah, so, so building up on what Ali Khan was saying, um, for, for me personally and for us as a set of initiatives that we're doing, um, one of the things that we recognize is that gentrification is a process of dispossession and displacement of people from land, um, as is colonization, the same. Um, it's dispossession and dis displacement of people from land, um, more oftentimes than not in a violent way. Um, so one of the reasons that I actually haven't become more implicated in the land trust in Milton Park is because there's this massive dissonance in my head um, about that, about the fact that on one hand, we have this extraordinary movement where hundreds of people were involved over over now decades to make Milton Park and the Land Trust um, the community that it is. Um, and that's incredible. And that, that, is, that is something that I think we all need to recognize as really extraordinary. And also the model in which they did it, the mixed model, mixed, mixed socioeconomic model, um, you know, really building into the community so that, so, that we, so that we were trying not to leave people behind. So I think all of that has to be celebrated. Um, and <laughs> the ambiguity uh, is that we are still occupiers on stolen land, and we are still um, we are still daily witnessing the SPVM, the police force of Montreal, harassing Indigenous and Inuit, um, arresting them, fining them. Yesterday or or on Saturday, they were out giving two hundred and fifty dollar tickets to people in the community for not social distancing. Um, you know, those kind of things. So those that kind of ongoing violence and colonization is still going on. And the discrepancy for me in that is that there are co-op members here um, that will on one hand celebrate the gentrification or the 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 fight against the win against gentrification and on the other hand be calling police 
um, on people for being in the alley or on, you know, on people who, whose behavior they don't like. Um, and, and so for me, that's a really, it's a discussion that for me really needs to be had. And it's not just one discussion. It's a series of discussions that we need to have on that. And what do we do about that? And, um, and just beyond, again, the kind of land acknowledgement thing where we acknowledge that there's a problem, but then we don't talk about it after that. I think we need to really seriously um, look at look at that and, um, and, and come together with other people from the community in terms of, of what we can do about that. Yeah. Thank you, Sue and Ali Khan and Nathan. I think that um, this kind of overview is really powerful. Um, often we know what we shouldn't talk about. <laughs> often we know what we, we don't, you know, what we, um, what we have to keep our distance from. I think in this conversation, we really want to stay close to tension, to the contradiction, so that we can illuminate where we're at and see where we can push the CLT model. Um, Joshua, it would be awesome if you, we have, um, if you can set up the breakout groups now. I, these are the questions for discussion. The breakout groups are meant to be quite participatory. Um, when you find yourself in a breakout group, please do uh, participate and talk. Um, the questions for discussion are number one, are community land trusts redistributing power? If so, how? Number two, what kinds of relationship building practices are reflected in community land trust funding, community ownership, and